Um, hi, party people. It's Black Genius. Happy Saturday. I have here with me Dr. Jennifer Peer and Faith Crittenden. We're going to get into Black health in the era of COVID. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I am like, when it comes to natural health, I, I go hard. So Jen and I, we always talking about, Jen is my doctor, so I'm biased. I'm a big fan of hers. Um, and we're always talking about like public health crises and like why black people are disproportionately dying from diseases that are preventable. Um, and Faith and I have a lot of the same conversations and Faith is always working on policy. She's working on legislation. So I said to both of them for the last several weeks, like we got to have a conversation and I want you guys to talk um, amongst yourselves and help us figure out as black folk, how we can take charge of our health, um, whether it's integrating the conventional with the natural, just kind of knowing what's going on with policy. For me, it's like all natural. I don't even want none of the conventional, but you know, I'm just, I'm trying to be diplomatic. Okay. So I want you guys to share, you know, to share your story. So we're going to get into um, Jennifer's story, Faith's story, and then we're going to get into, you know, black health and, and race as a, you know, racism as a, as a public health crisis. Um, so where are you guys at? So Jennifer, you're in, you're, you're in New Haven. Faith is yeah. in. Faith I'm in, um, Vermont. Yeah. So I'm in the Northern part of Connecticut. All right. So how are things going? Like, how has COVID affected you as a doctor, Jen? I'm sure it's been, you know, you don't work in the emergency room, but I'm sure it's no. been. So talk about um, that. It has. So um, it has been very interesting. So when COVID kind of kicked in and we talked about this on the, the other other thing we recorded, but um, when COVID kicked in, um, I work in private practice. So I had to make a decision pretty quickly about what we were going to do. Um, we didn't have any PPE. There was no particular plan about anything. So I pretty early on decided that we were going to do telemedicine because I just felt like the risk was great. Like you said, I don't, I don't work in emergency medicine. So I'm family practice and um, we don't have that kind of equipment. So and I treat patients with flu, cold symptoms all the time. That's not foreign to me. And I don't wear gloves or masks or anything. So um, literally the day I decided a patient came in with symptoms and I was just like, you know what? We need to start thinking about going the telemedicine route. And, um, and that's exactly what I did. So as of March, I believe it was March 16th, um, we went telemedicine. Um, and to answer the rest of your question, I have been seeing patients, um, pretty much people who are recovering or when they're at the point where they think they have symptoms. So we've been trying to manage that process, um, giving them information about testing centers, um, working with people who have, you know, in recovery from COVID and what they can do. Um, so that's where I'm at and in, in what I've been seeing. And what about you, Faith? How has COVID, how is all the madness is happening? How has that affected you? Yeah, so um, COVID has hit me more personally. Um, I lost both my um, grandfather and my uncle to COVID um, in two different situations a week apart. Um, so I've seen it on both sides. I've seen, um, and they were in New York City um, in the Bronx. Um, so in the Bronx, if you guys have been reading, has been hit very hard by COVID. Um, just because, as we know, it's the structural, you know, racism in terms of like institutionalized and all that kind of stuff plays a huge role in the health of um, black people in, in America in general. So they were victims of that system. And so for me, talking about COVID in that lens has been very eye opening. But one thing I can say that's been positive is I've been able to take their story and kind to kind of use it to educate, you know, my fellow, you know, medical students and federal federal fellow health professionals and just making sure that they're aware of like what's taking place when it comes to black lives that are affected by COVID and not only black lives, but also Native American lives and just lives of people of color in general when it comes to that. Yeah. And, you know, everything that you told that you taught me about policy and about like, you know, end of life care. Like, I really want to get into all of that. Um, but before we do so, let's back up. Let's tell the people your stories, you know, how you got into medicine. Um, what your, you know, what your motivations are. So we'll start with you, Jen. You, your story started in Haiti, but you were born in New York. Yeah, I was born in Jamaica, Queens, New York. Um, 
And then uh, we um, we lived in Laurelton for a while. We moved to Long Island. So I always say I'm a hybrid. I have both the urban and suburban. Um, and um, so my parents are both immigrants from Haiti. And I was raised with a lot of that culture. So I was very familiar with natural medicine just as a result of my culture. So if I was sick, my mom would boil certain teas. There were certain cleanses and things that um, she shared with me um, culturally. And then um, both of my parents were in the medical field. So it was, again, another hybrid hybridization. So my dad is like super science, math geek. So he was a lab technologist. Now he's retired. Um, so he would take me to work with him and I would look at lab specimens, stool specimens, um, uh, blood, all those kinds of things. And my mom um, is a retired nurse. So she you would take me to that work that with stuff. her as well. Huh? You actually you enjoyed that stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 I did. I always loved, I always would joke and say I love blood and guts. So um, <laughs> I enjoyed that. Um, as a child, we kind of talked about this before I was anemic. So um, my dad would, you know, bring his stuff home and take my blood and tell me about blood and samples and hematology. So I, I loved all of it. And, you know, even though there's a joke, um, you know, Faith knows this, West Indian parents are always, you know, doctor, lawyer, engineer. So yep. <laughs> um, as much as they push that, I actually did have an affinity for medicine. And at first I thought I wanted to be a nurse because my mom was a nurse and I thought they were amazing and caring and I still do. And then um, as time went on, when I was in uh, biology class and I started dissecting things, I wanted to be a surgeon. So my journey um, was originally going the conventional route. I was pre-med at Cornell University, CU, Big Red. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, then as I went on, I started learning more about the healthcare system and certain things about the infrastructure that I felt could be done better. And then I came, I got to an impasse where, um, you know, I figured out I couldn't go the conventional route because it, I wanted more in terms of prevention, found out about public health, um, applied, went to school, got my master's in public health from um, SUNY Albany School of Public Health. Um, and this is where um, some of our conversations with faith kind of intersect. Um, I loved the prevention aspect of public health. But then started feeling like I also wanted that micro lens of medicine. So the medicine never went away. It was like I went the public health route because I felt like I wanted to do more on a macro level with community health and um, legislation. So public health for people who aren't familiar gives you a good uh, breadth of knowledge of environmental health. Um, you know, uh, so you learn about inequities, um, epidemiology, which we're talking about so much with COVID. Like now people actually know what this stuff is. And I'm the type of person who likes to know, I like to be in a profession that has different routes. And what I loved about it is it was everything. It was statistics, it was policy, it was, you know, community health. So learning why do certain populations have these diseases? And what we're probably going to get into more is, you know, COVID and why do certain populations, again, have certain diseases. So I worked in public health um, for a while, um, prenatal health. I worked at Brooklyn Hospital as a prenatal health educator. I did um, health, um, health professions research at uh, University of Albany. Um, I did some research on geriatrics. Um, what else? I did some mental health work. Um, I worked at a, um, a group home for MICA patients. So that's mentally ill, chemically addicted adults. So that kind of goes into my mental health bend. Um, and then I also did some exploration. Um, I say to people, I used my 20s as a time to really just learn about anything health related. So I learned about meditation and yoga, became a yoga instructor. Um, learned a lot about just eating healthy for your body, nutrition. And then um, I found out about naturopathic medicine um, when I was working at the group home for mentally ill adults, because I still felt like I wanted to do something on a micro level and the love for medicine and actually practicing didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and like many people who kind of have that natural bend, you look into lots of things like, is it chiropractics or is it, you know, becoming a DO or that's an osteopathic doctor for people who don't know. 
So I just spent this time just trying to figure out what matched better. Like there was a program in Cuba that I was looking into. Um, and then I found out about naturopathic medicine. And to me, it felt like the perfect combination because we had to learn about conventional medicine because most of our patients come in with medication. They're already on medication. So we had to know about that. But then we also had some natural therapeutics that we, we were able to learn about and employ. So that kind of was a full circle moment for me. And public health, I always say, actually pushed me even further the natural route, because as you learn the history of public health, you really learn about the inequities in the system and how we got to where we are today. Um, so that was, you know, it was, it was, I was able to combine all my knowledge together. And I really think um, medicine in general is, is under, I feel like public health is the umbrella and different types of medicine are underneath that. Because if you are a physician, you have to be aware of these inequities and um, policy, and you just have to know about these things. You can't be in a vacuum. So um, I always say public health is the umbrella and different forms of medicine are just the tools that we use to help heal our patients. Um, so yeah, so that's where I am today. That brought me to, you know, and then in that journey, I wound up, coming uh coming to new haven so um i'm here now practicing and now you're chief medical officer at revive wellness. yeah revive wellness center yes all right um okay so faith you know so your, your family kind of spans blackness you got caribbean roots you got southern american roots um talk about your upbringing and how medicine became your path to giving back yeah, so um, just starting off with that. Um, so my mom is first generation um, Caribbean American, specifically Jamaican. Um, my grandmother came to America um, in 1941. Um, she's one of the people that actually came through Ellis Island. Like we were able to find her paperwork to show that she did come through Ellis Island and we found her passport and stuff like that. So it's very rare because when people talk about Ellis Island, they don't mention that black people go through it. Um, but my <laughs> grandmother is one of the people who went through Ellis Island. She came here, she studied here. She lived actually with a dentist who went to Meharry, Medi um, Meharry Dental College um, and one of, one of the first um, Caribbean cohorts at Meharry. Most people don't remember that Caribbeans have traveled back and forth for a while going to um, met black medical schools. Um, so she grew up basically in medicine herself and that kind of like translated down into our family, the idea, the concept of education uh, concept of making sure that you're educated not only in terms of like you know um, academics but understanding black education in terms of like our history our idea of liberation so I have that very much on my mother's side on my father's side uh, we come from basically the very very deep south which is Alabama like if I told you the actual place which is like River, River Fall, Alabama you cannot find that on the map <laughs> that's how southern we are and I love that aspect of my family. Um, if you meet my grandparents, they are very much, they go back every year to River Falls, to where they grew up. That's where their friends are. That's where they know their life. Um, and they are, um, you know, children of sharecroppers. Um, most people think like, oh, like, you know, people picked cotton like years ago. Like, no, my grandmother picked cotton. So, and I'm going to tell that people like really changes their mindset. Um, so I come from a very two different backgrounds and then meshing them together um, has been a journey. Um, <laughs> you got the conservative on one side and then you got the radical on the other side. How does that work? Absolutely. Um, so I would say my father's family, which is very surprisingly, um, is from the South, is very conservative. And I think that's a lot to do with the history of how they had to deal with growing up in the South. Um, so for them to take on very racial issues is not their forte. And I completely understand and respect that. Um, while you have my mother's side of the family that grew up in New York City and very much around a cultural like a landscape, they're very much more outspoken when it comes to black rights and liberation. Um, that's just very interesting growing up in a household where you have two different perspectives on how to handle this world. Um, but I, as you can see, I've chose the more like liberal kind of black liberation side and I love it um you know and I've enjoyed it very much so awesome, awesome. before background. we get into go ahead oh no no go ahead so before we get into our black health questions I just want to shout out everybody that's watching so shout out to Iowa Daily shout out to Martine New York Angel shout out to hey. Vanessa Harris uh, we got IT in the in the comments 
drop your name, drop where you're watching from. If you have any questions for these medical professionals, like please drop them in the comments so that we can um, we can engage with you guys. Okay, so when we said we want to have a conversation about black health right now, clearly, you know, the world is crumbling <laughs> around us, right? America is falling apart. Um, and you have a lot of people, you got millions of people taken to the street trying to deliver a new world, right? Um, and COVID is still a very real threat, right? You got people out there marching with masks on. So when we talk about black health in a time like this, what do you think people should have at the forefront of their minds in terms of you know preserving their health and the health of their families? Um, I think it's important to listen to the recommendations that are coming out of the CDC, but at the same time, we are living in a time where history is literally repeating itself. I mean, when we had the pandemic, it, it really is. It's when we had the pandemic of, you know, 1918, that went into 1919, we still had riots. There were black riots that happened during this time period as well. I mean, there were parades and stuff like that that spread, you know, the flu virus too. So we're just really repeating ourselves. So, I mean, to tell them to not go out and protest for your rights, that's kind of like going against even the ethics of what's being a doctor. I mean, it's to do no harm. If we're seeing harm that's being done in our society towards black people, as a physician, you should want to stand up. Even yes, it does put you at risk for getting a virus and stuff like that, but it still is the same type of virus. Racism is a virus within ourselves that we have dealt for centuries at this point. So you're still fighting two viruses at the same time. Wow. What do you think? <laughs> I love Oh my God, I love I love what you said. Um, I just saw a statement. I forget what 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 from what organization, but I know collectively um, many physicians are signing petitions talking about you know that that's kind of like this weird place, right? Like as a physician, you know that people assembling <laughs> coming together are actually increasing their risk for contracting the disease. But a lot of physicians have come out and spoken and said, well, this is just as important. And how they're intertwined. I forgot what article I was reading. So basically, it's intertwined. So people have to protest against this because that's the only way change is going to happen. I'm all for it. Um, I love that the revolution is happening. Um, you know, historically. You going to be marching? Huh? You going to protest? Have you been out to some protests? No, I haven't just because of work. But um, I'm, f I'm all for it because... Um, you know, I, you know, if you talk about Haitians, Haitian revolution, that is my spirit. That is my core. Um, I really don't want to hear anything about people complaining about how inconvenient it is. Um, that's, that's where I come from. That's, that's the spirit that's within me and my veins from my ancestors. So, you know, you can't, unfortunately, and everyone has their own way. Like I posted something yesterday about there's different ways to support the movement. And sometimes you feel helpless because you can't be on the front lines. Um, you know, work, I'm exhausted. I'm doing lots of different things. So um, there's different ways for people to go out and protest. Like for me, I honestly, my strongest thing is economics. And I just feel like people need to be focused on economics. Like, what is it like three trillion or whatever amount of money that black people put into the economy. So to me, it's economics. Nobody cares unless their money is being hit. That's why everybody's coming out talking about oh, you know, hey, we support black rights. I mean, like you have to because, you know, we spend the most money. So, you know, wow. we don't we don't really understand the power that we have as a black community. And to me, I feel like economics is one of the biggest things we've been protesting and not to say that it's not worth it um, because it's inconveniencing people, which is also causing money loss, which is great. So um, that's what gets people's attention, I believe, in America. It's money. They don't care about health. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to yeah. be real transparent and frank. I feel like America doesn't care enough about people's health. I've had issues with this for a very long time, which is why I took the journey I took. Um, and so when you say what should people be aware of, people should be aware of that their rights are being taken away from them. And no, it's not just gun rights, um, that they don't have options, enough options for health care. Um, they they have no idea what's been going on. And so now for the first time, people's eyes are open about, oh, my God, like I could die from this disease. And this is the first time many people have ever been afraid for their health. 
So I'm actually healthy, health happy that people are aware of, you know, what's going on and how when you compare to other countries, you don't have as many rights um, and access to health care. People need to know. Um, so I'm happy people's eyes are being open to what's really happening. So what so for those who, you know, maybe watching who are going to protest, maybe on a daily or, you know, frequently, what can they do to protect themselves? What kind of, you know, safeguards besides from wearing a mask? Is there anything that they can do when they get home to just kind of make sure like they're, you know, they can minimize their, um, their likelihood of getting sick? There's, yeah, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I actually, so I'm in like a big group me with a lot of people who are doing things for protests in terms of the medicine side and being there as medics. Um, I would just, one thing that I would warn I've seen recently is making sure you bring your own bottle of water. Do not take anything from anyone who's giving anything out because I've seen that they were trying to poison protesters um, using, yeah, they like, <laughs> poison the water. Not ready. And they were trying to get people sick. So bring your. Who are they? Who are they? Who they? Yeah, they? You know who they. <laughs> yeah. The people who are against this is they. <laughs> yes, the they. Um, so make sure you're bringing your own things, never take from anybody else. Um, making sure that you do have a mask. Um, obviously, social distancing is a challenge, um, obviously, because you're at a protest. Um, but make sure that you're, if you're seeing, if you're around people who are like coughing and stuff like that, you know, just be like, all right, need to choose another spot to protest in. Um, but just being aware of your surroundings. If you see somebody who's like doing things that are a little bit chaotic, don't stand there and be in the situation, separate yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I've also seen for a lot of people who are more in the professional field are very uncomfortable going out. Um, so I've noticed that just be careful of your social media contacts and making sure that, you know, you turn off your cell phone data is what I've heard. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want your cell phone data to be tracked um, and the police can track you. And after you protest, a lot of people have known that they come find you. Wow. Um, so just be aware of that. So. Damn. Okay. <laughs> What do you say, Dr. Pierre? Um, that's real. Um, thank you for sharing some of those things. On my end, um, a lot of my colleagues have been posting um, a list of, you know, ways to protect yourself. So, you know, tear gas, things about like not wearing contacts, um, uh, because if you get it in your eyes, it can cause some issues. Um, making sure when you're rinsing your eyes out to use milk. Um, so, different lists like that. I'm actually probably going to post that. I, I'm thinking about adding it to my website as well. Um, but that is pretty much, it's been those types of things. Like if this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. Make sure you're carrying these supplies and things on you. So um, that's that's what I've been getting from my end. So everybody knows that, you know, at this point, what's been reported is that Black people have been disproportionately affected by COVID, right? Due to a million reasons, because we have, <laughs> you know, we have food deserts in our neighborhoods because we have minimal health care because we're terrified of, you know, conventional doctors who could care less. Mm -hmm. You know, there's enough data out there. There's enough research documenting how Black people's pain is not valued or measured at the same rate. They, you know, when we go to the doctor, and I've had personal experiences with this. We've talked about this a lot. Um, Jen, you know, you go to the doctor and you're like, you know, you're, you're okay, just drink some more water or just take this or just, you know, and they're just really happy to, to drop a pill in your, you know, in a prescription. So can we talk a little bit about just kind of like the state of health care for Black people in America and what you would like to see come out of the movement? That's a loaded question. <laughs> what you know, angle would you like to speak from? <laughs> Angle. You know, you know, both of us can like. <laughs> oh, man. I want you to go in. I want you to go in. What would you like to see happen across the board as far as you know, care for black people? Um, hmm. I think it goes back to what MLK said, and most people have really overlooked his quote when he comes to talk about healthcare. And healthcare, he said, is a racist system. He did not spare it. He said, healthcare is racist. Most people in this country do not realize when did our hospitals become integrated? You know, we grew up in a generation of integrated hospitals. My mother mm. was born in one of the first integrated hospitals in the year that hospital integration happened. 
where you're people don't realize that you know that's 1965 when Medicare and Medicaid <laughs> was established. Um, most people don't realize that our hospitals have been segregated for most of your grandparents' lives. You know the healthcare that they receive as children were not um, health was not up to the par that it should have been. You know, and we don't talk about healthcare and how the system of healthcare has been affected by racism. And that's the reason why we're seeing the health disparities that we are seeing. Because most people are like, okay, why are we having these health disparities? Well, it goes back to our history of how we are looking at race and how we look at medicine and how, you know, our ancestors were treated as slaves and the quality of healthcare they received and how that translated into our DNA. And that's translated yes. into generations of DNA. And what we're seeing now are the health outcomes that we now call health disparities. Mm -hmm. I love that you brought that up because what angers me is that when people talk about these things, I've seen so many, you know, racist things online about, you know, constantly focusing on, well, how come black people are where they are now? And like you guys and you guys and always pointing out these failures as if it's something that we've done, but never going back into history and tracing it like 1965 just happened. You know what I mean? And so I love that you brought up the DNA because there's so many, there's so much research around that. There's so much research around epigenetics. If people aren't familiar, how your environment can affect your DNA. So people have to go back to history. And in America, I noticed that people just like to skip over stuff and like blame, blame, blame. It's always a black person's fault for where they are. So economically, we can go back to history and see redlining in so many ways that black people were even when they did manage to go through all, go, go past all the odds and be successful, how things were burned and destroyed, like in Tulsa and, you know, Black Wall Street. So anyway, I digress. But um, as far as like you were mentioning these health disparities, another thing to look at is, you know, the fact that, you know, all those things happen when you're talking about the integration, but also that all links to exactly what's happening now. So people think the racism is gone. So if you're already starting at the bottom as far as healthcare disparities because of what was passed on to you, let's talk about how stress affects the body, right? The fact that we're dealing, constantly dealing with all these stressors because of economics, because of not being heard, because of having these health issues and not really finding any solutions for that. Let's talk about how that could potentially hurt someone because now there's tons of research on stress and how that affects people. So we're just going to gloss over that again. And then again, <laughs> going to the blaming. So these health disparities are here because they started from somewhere. And so now even black people need to be aware because there's comments like, Oh, I have, I got the sugar because the grandparent had the sugar and it's deeper than that. Mm. It's, it's, there's more. And then there's even more blame in, in our diets. Right. But people are not realizing how did those diets start? They started because slaves didn't have access to the better foods. They got the scraps from their um, masters. And so now that has been integrated into a lot of the foods that black people eat. And so there's blame about, oh, this isn't healthy. This is not he this is healthy. This isn't. And there's always blame about black foods not being healthy. But how did it get this way? Mm. So things I like to talk to uh, patients about very often is, you know, you can still eat your ancestral foods or foods that you like, and you just have to change the ingredients because this blame about your food is wrong is actually very dangerous and it, it turns people off. And so when you're communicating with patients, you need to know their language. You need to be culturally aware of what they're eating and you can find ways to make what they're eating healthy instead of maligning something that's deep and cultural to them. So uh, that's another piece of the health disparities. Hmm? You guys both went into the history and how, you know, we're not really taught the history of, you know, food and, and medical care in America. And Faith, you and I have had a lot of conversations about how in med school, they don't teach history, <laughs> which like completely blew my mind. Um, Farrelly Ayodele is asking about how can, how can we institute curriculums on humane care and social inequities in medical schools across the board. So I'd love to hear what y'all's okay. like vision of changing the medical curriculum would look like. So I, I will take this from a policy aspect. It is um, a challenge um, to change medical curriculum. It is a battle. It is when you enter in and when we're trying to bring resolutions to the floor and at these you know huge medical bodies, it's a non-starter for them. 
to mm -hmm. even bring up changing one part of the curriculum. So that's the first battle that we have to face is saying that curriculum has to be, a, a, we have to start talking about it. To then talk about um, racial disparities and um, you know health disparities, um, it's still, medicine is very still conservative. Um, they don't like to address their history because the history of medicine is ugly. It is very ugly. Mm. <laughs> it's from every type of um, specialty, from pediatrics all the way to surgery. It's a very ugly history. Let's 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 deal with that for just a second. <laughs> let's talk about a few. You know, I, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I just want you to touch on like a couple of the ugliest aspects of you know medical history in America. Okay, um, I will start with mostly what people talk about more, which is OBGYN, and how um, that is basically with the father of modern day OBGYN and how he basically um, performed um, surgeries on um, enslaved black women um, without using anesthesia, even though anesthesia at the time he was practicing was available. Um, and we do not know the names of all of the women that were um, used in his experiments, um, but we know that he did practice this and he was, he's now considered the father of modern OBGYN. And recently, I think in New York, they finally tore down his monuments, because mind you, mind you, he has monuments wow. in his honor for being- What's this, what this, what this mother F's name is? What's his name? Um, I think it's J. Mar Marion Sims is his okay. name. Um, so there are monuments in his honor um, and that was hiding the history that these black women had undergo with him. And not only was he not only experimenting on black women, but he was also experimenting on black children. And mm. He was like literally, you know, and I don't want to be too graphic because it's like I said, it's a very ugly history. But he would be experimenting on infants in a way, looking at their brains and things like that. So when you have, like I said, medicine's history is very, very ugly. Um, and it's, it's one that medicine is now confronting because now as medical students and as attendings and residents, people are saying, no, we need to look at this history. My colleague needs to understand this history. You know, they need to be able when they go into the room and they see a black patient, not only a black patient, but Native American patient, a, 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 you know, a Hispanic patient, understand why they have this mistrust of the system. It goes back to that. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm hmm. So, OK, so before, you know, without going too deep into like the trauma, you know, we talked in our last conversation about the 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 sort of public health crisis that racism is. Right. And you, you guys have both talked a lot about policy. Um, we, we mentioned that we need to change and a lot of people in the comments seem to agree with you that we need to change the curriculum. Right. Um, in medical school. What. What does it look like for Black people to take charge of their own health? Um, now that COVID, you know, I'm sure you guys saw all of the, the viral clips and videos of people like boiling lemon skin and ginger and, and orange peel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, can, I, can, I, can. I was like, yes, they're taking charge of their health, boy. You know, everybody, all the kids were talking about their parents going crazy because they boiling all this lemon skin, lemon peel. What does it look like for Black people to start taking charge and people generally can start taking charge of their health and not even, you know, because we're already so uh, suspicious of the of the medical establishment, how do we own our health? So I, I got a lot to say about this. So because I am a naturopathic doctor, I see a lot of patients who have, um, you know, they're very upset about the system. Um, they're at this place where they don't want to take medication. I'm always talking to people off the ledge, right? Because they're angry, they've had bad experiences. And unfortunately, they found me because, you know, naturopathic medicine is a last resort. It's like, I need a holistic doctor. I need somebody who's going to give me herbs instead of medication. So I need to make this very clear. Not everybody is ready to just go to taking herbs, right? I need to make this clear. And, and this is coming from someone who is very pro-natural medicine, right? People need to understand you. If you have pre-existing health conditions, if you have straight up diabetes, you can't just jump to that. Now you can take steps, which is what I help patients with all the time. You can take steps to get to that point where you can transition to that some people, maybe your Medicaid, like I've helped people lower medication dosages, like that can happen, but you can't just sit back and think it's going to happen without you doing the work. The work means changing your diet, which is a huge part. 
it's fundamental to making any changes in your health. So when you say take, you know, what can people do? Change your diet. And unfortunately, there's so many misconceptions about diet and what that means and what's healthy. There's keto, there's paleo, there's all these kinds of um, diets that people are hearing about, but people are doing it without guidance. And then unfortunately, they're going to their medical doctor who, and this is no shade, I'm just being real, who did not learn nutrition in medical school because in conventional medical school, you don't learn nutrition except for a few schools. There are a few schools who have tried implementing it. Um, so as a result, people go to their medical doctors and sometimes when they're talking about taking a supplement or an herb or something, then the doctor kind of poo poos it. Like, what are you talking about? They don't work because that's not their knowledge base. So I always say to people, level set, understand that your medical doctor was not educated on this. So unfortunately, they're going with some of the research they've looked at, which is biased a lot of the times, but they are looking at the research and the research is telling them that supplements don't work and things don't work. But there's a nuance in that. There's a nuance in bad quality supplements, for instance. So everybody wants to like, oh, I'm taking this supplement for this disease, but you're taking a bad quality supplement. And a lot of the research is done on bad quality supplements, just like everything else. There's a level to the supplements you take. And so you need to take a good quality supplement. The other part about nutrition. So now if you're going to your medical doctor and you want to talk about nutrition and that's not their wheelhouse, that means then now you need to seek out somebody who understands nutrition, whether that is uh, a functional medical nutritionist, because unfortunately, a lot of the dietitians follow the same guidelines by the FDA and the medical system at large. So now they're going to tell you the same thing. They're going to tell you, oh yeah, drink milk every day, which I have a problem with. <laughs> they're going to tell you, you know, they're, they're still using the antiquated food pyramid of when I was a child, right? Which is why when Michelle Obama came in and was like, eat more vegetables, I was like, yay, at least now the vegetable portion of the food pyramid is a little larger. So, um, and yes, I am promoting my profession because naturopathic doctors do learn nutrition and we do learn supplementation. We do learn dosing of herbs and supplements, which is extremely important. So it's a little dangerous for me when I see people, um, you know, concocting things. Now, I will say we know that black people at large have a history of natural medicine that has been passed down. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with making herbal teas. There's nothing wrong with making concoctions. The problem I have is when I see WhatsApp, right, and have my Haitian relatives sending me things um, about, hey, this will cure COVID, that's very problematic. Um, we don't have enough information to say something's curing COVID. Now, do I believe that it's possible and that natural medicine has a place in that? Of course I do, because I do think that if you are trying to look at treatments for COVID, you do need to look at natural medicine because we've looked at what the Chinese have done. And the Chinese have managed to do some treatment with it that involves natural medicine. Why is it so hard to incorporate natural medicine, but yet you can use a drug that has not been tested. And now we have the first clinical results of hydroxychloroquine that is showing that it's actually not effective for COVID. We can use an experiment with that, but we can't use an experiment with natural medicine that doesn't have side effects for the large part. So I'm saying a lot and I'm touching on a lot of things, but this is, this is what's very problematic for me. Like natural medicine has a place and until we start incorporating it into our healthcare system in the form of, yes, supplementation, but also diet and nutrition, also factoring in stress in these disease um, you know, path, path processes and, and pathologies, then we will make some headway. But until we keep ignoring and just think that there's going to be some magic pill that's going to fix us, it's going to be a problem. So that, that's what I feel about all of this. I want to hear your faith response. To all of that, I 100% agree. Um, that's the I I love naturopathic medicine. I believe in it. Um, I do advocate for it when I see a patient. I'm like, look, we need to first when you're like coming in, your blood pressure is like, um, you know, 140 over, you know, 100. I'm like, first of all, the first conversation you're gonna have, what have you been eating? And you know, people are like, uh, I've been eating vegetables. I'm like, really? What vegetables have you been eating? You know, you have to like potato chips. Potatoes are vegetable. You know, I'm eating pork 
pork and beans and I'm eating blah, blah, blah. And we start, we have to start there. We have to start with your diet and how your lifestyle is. And that leads, you know, to making changes in that diet. And I very much agree with that. And I just want to also bring up to the point, going back to the original question, is like, what do Black people need to do? Um, we need to go back to, and a lot of people don't understand the history of medicine. That's why it's so important. But we need to go back to what the Black Panthers did. And most people look at the Black Panthers and they don't remember that they did a huge health movement. I mean, they wow. were the ones that inspired community health. You know, and going out there and making sure you understand your health at the community level. And the medical system took what the Black Panthers did and incorporated it into the system. But we don't talk about that. Um, but a lot of the white doctors actually worked with the Black Panthers to increase the awareness of, you know, not only Black people, but also poor people with their community um, clinics that they had across the nation. I and want you to bring that awareness. And I want you to say more. To take control of their health. I want you to say more about that. We have a comment from Nadine who says Eastern medicine was part of the Black Panther movement. So shout out to everybody who's watching and commenting. Hi Nadine, hi Raquel, hi Evan, hi Alex. Um, so do you know about this, this history? This is the first time I'm hearing this too. And I know, yes, of course, the Black Panthers were very, very visionary and you know, totally transformed the way Black people were dealt with in, in the US. Um, what were some of the things, you know, in addition to this Eastern medicine, what were some of the things that they did that, you know, modern medicine kind of incorporated? Um, well, like going back to the concept of community clinics, a lot of um, before the Black Panther, we didn't really have community clinics. We didn't have like places where you can meet your physician if you did not have insurance, if you wow. didn't have a, a regular physician to come in and talk about, you know, how do you take care of control of your health? Um, mm -hmm. At these, you know, clinics, they had like, you know, um, with pap smear screenings and like teaching women how to do your own pap smear. You know, and they're like had professionals in there, you know, not not just like they had people who were like, you know, I'm a doctor. No, they had actual medical professionals. And you can even look at the history of like a prominent place like Yale. Yale participated and worked with the Black Panthers when it came to health care. Wow. You know, so it's not like you had like these random people out there. And, it, and there's such a relationship between medicine and the movement of black people. And that led to a lot of the community clinics that you see nowadays that are like this um, CHCs and things that I've had the opportunity to work at that was birthed out of that movement. And it just changed how community medicine was done in America. But people don't like to give credit to the Black Panthers for that. But that is one of the things that they did to change medicine. Wow. That's amazing. Do you have anything to add, Jennifer, before I go on to my next question? No, I just want to say thank you for sharing that, Faith, because I didn't know about um, that. I knew about like the preliminary things that you were talking about mm -hmm. and how that led to certain changes in modern medicine. But I didn't know about the clinics that they had gotten that model from them. Um, yeah, that that piece was definitely new to me. So thank you for sharing that. Wow. It's so really important because Black Panthers are maligned, right? Yes. <laughs> and there's never and anything like, positive. We have, we have to revisit history because a lot of things that the Black Panthers did has changed our education system. Yes. Yes. System. <laughs> Most people don't realize that free and reduced lunch is from the Black yes. Panthers, specifically Shaka Khan. But nobody wants to give her credit for that. <laughs> like, but, you know. Whoa, she's yeah. schooling us, man. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> we have to do another, another episode. Yeah, thank, so we, yeah, thank you so much. You know, like I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of the Black Panthers, of course. And, you know, when we say malign, malign by who, right? Because the mm -hmm. people they were serving. They. <laughs> that part. Okay, so I wanted to talk about mental health as, as one of the, you know, one of the areas where we can kind of take charge of our health. Um, we talked a little bit about therapy on our last call. What is your advice for folks, you know, who are kind of dabbling or thinking about taking their mental health seriously? Like, how important is our mental health and how can we take ownership of it and, and you know, stay healthy in that area? Get a therapist. Everyone should, everyone should have a therapist. I, I scream this to the hilltops, every single person. Uh, people tend to think it's somebody who has a mental health issue. We all have mental health issues. If you're black, not only in America, if you're black, you need a therapist, right? Because there's so much we internalize. And even this myth, we're talking about like how, you know, black women, how black people are treated when they go to doctors. We think the same thing. We believe it. Oh, we're strong. We don't need that. You know, we push through like we have no choice, but that doesn't mean we're okay. 
And even as we go through this time period and we're watching COVID, we're, you know, being, um, you know, there's an attack on our mental health. First of all, there's attack. I think it's, I think it's very intentional. We literally watched a man die on social media. Like we, we watched that. And I generally, you know, try to preserve my mental health by not watching those videos, because honestly, I can say I've been like desensitized in a lot of ways. I don't want to like carry more of that in, but I watched that video. I watched it and I watched a man's life being taken away and that will stay with me forever. And the first thing I thought about is those people who watched it, I was like, are they okay? Right. They're not okay. I saw an interview with the guy who you hear in the, the, the video and he's saying, stop. And you, oh, like stop. And he, you could tell he wants to do something, but he's fearing for his own life. Mm-hmm. Those people are not okay. Mm-hmm. They're not okay. That little girl who recorded it, she was 17 years old. She's not okay. So we're not okay. Um, you know, my husband likes to say this thing, like we're in a stage four cancer. That is what the black community is experiencing. And I think it's so, a- it, it's so accurate because we deal with all these microaggressions at work in our communities, all these different problems that we're constantly being blamed for, and yet we don't talk about it. And it's not enough to talk to another Black person, unfortunately. In a lot of ways, yes, they can relate, but they're harboring pain too. And so now you're expecting them to fix your problems when they're still in pain. And so it just doesn't work. So I'm a big advocate for therapy. Um, We talked about this um, previously, that if you can find a culturally sensitive therapist, I'm not saying that some white therapists don't know how to do this. Some of them have done the work, but there's nothing like a therapist who looks like you, who understands you, a therapist who understands your culture. Like if you're Caribbean, having a therapist who actually understands what that upbringing was like. If you're African-American, someone who understands that. And for me, I feel like for Black people specifically, it's very helpful if you have a Black therapist because Mm -hmm. they can really understand. Um, But if you can't find that, you still need a therapist. Do the best that you can. And I tell people, do not give up. It's huge for me. We need therapists. We need to embrace that. And I'm so happy when I'm seeing like when uh, a lot of the posts went out on Blackout Tuesday, people were posting about culturally sensitive Um, therapists that you can get online. There's free services even that people can take advantage of. So that, that is, that is my whole thing about mental health. Um, And as I told you, I was a mental health counselor and I saw a lot of stuff. And from that point, it made me really get a good understanding about the failures in mental health as well that we don't talk about. It's not just for black people in general, the medical community has largely ignored that a lot of funds have not been put into mental health Um, And it's just throwing a drug at people and not going to the root of what is causing a lot of these mental health issues. And if we try to ignore racism and think that people are going to get better, this is only compounding the issue for black people having to witness these murders over and over again. I'm going to call them assassinations on black people. Genocide. 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 It's, It's happening over and over and over again. And like, we no one has even acknowledged our pain publicly like no one acknowledges you know historically what um you know slavery has done to us you know people talk a lot about jews but at least people acknowledge their holocaust they have not acknowledged publicly the black holocaust they have not but yet you know their their struggle has been you know no one can say anything about that right you open your mouth you're blackball but no one has said anything about our our holocaust so how do we find a culturally sensitive therapist? I know Taraji P. Henson was doing some work to kind of provide free therapy. Where can people start to find somebody who um, is? I think, I think you also, you know, to answer your question, when you're talking about culturally sensitive, you also have to be comfortable with realizing that you can still be a Christian or of your religion and still seek therapy. Mm-hmm. There's like been a divide. And I gro- knew that growing up and a very, having some very conservative, like, um, family on my father's side with the idea of like oh you go you pray first that's the only thing you do you got an issue you pray and even you know and i and i understand the power of prayer and i believe in it but at the same time i know that i need to sit down and talk to somebody Mm -hmm. i mean and i go to me i go to the bible and i look at um what jesus Mm -hmm. did because yes he was around crowds of people yes he preached the word but there were times where he retreated and he was in you know places of solitude and he was there, yes, he was praying, but he was away from people. And he was only had 12 friends. He only had 12 friends who really knew who he was. 
So he talked to somebody, you know? So for you as a Christian to not understand the importance of therapy and, and, and understand the importance of what Jesus did in order to seek his form of therapy, you know, we have to bridge that connect. So that's also important when you're seeking someone who's culturally sensitive, you know, because as a church, we do have therapists within the church, but they have missed that disconnect and in, in understanding the importance of having a person who you can just lay on things and be able to kind of get it out of you in order to receive the pouring back into you for healing. And when we talked about Jesus, we talked about him meditating, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, so let's talk about that for one second. Like what, <laughs> how can people get started with meditation? What do you guys think about meditation? And what are some of the science behind like the effectiveness, the efficacy of meditation? Tons of research on meditation. I just wanted to say something also with the church. There's also pastoral counseling. People forget that. If you go to any divinity school, Yale Divinity School, for example, I know that they teach pastoral counseling and they have internships where people can do that. So I just wanted to say that. Um, But for meditation, um, this is near and dear and close to my heart because, um, as Faith said, I'm also a Christian and I never had an issue integrating the two. I don't think that they conflict um, Jesus meditated. I mean, we see that in the Bible, we see the mm-hmm. passages about meditate on the word. So, um, there's different ways to do meditation and people don't feel comfortable if there's, you know, if there's some Eastern, um, you know, uh, particularly in Indian culture, it's, you know, if you feel like that's not something that feels comfortable to you, meditate on the word, you know, meditation. I like to say that prayer is, um, is talking to God and meditation is listening. So it, it's listening in that silence and allowing things to come to you. And we spend so much time talking and moving and acting and doing, we don't leave enough time to listen. And um, you ask, how do you get started? For me, I like to teach because my background is in, I've also done yoga and meditation. I was a yoga instructor um, for many years. So the first way to start is just breathing. I, you, I even incorporate this with my patients and showing people how to breathe and just learning how to stop. So very simple exercises is learning the correct way to breathe. So before you get to all the complicated things that people get intimidated by is learning the proper way to breathe. I would say to people, look at how a baby breathes. If you watch a baby, they know how to breathe properly, right? When they're inhaling, their belly's expanding. When they're exhaling, their belly, their belly is moving back towards their spine. So if you watch that, that's how we should breathe. So we don't even breathe. And the breath that we get circulates the oxygen throughout our body, allowing us to think and move and live. And so there's a ton of research about how meditation is helpful for lowering, um, not only just lowering stress, but there's a lot of research on hypertension and things like that. So um, to answer your question, that that's how I would say to get started um, is just learning how to breathe. There's lots of apps like Calm and, and things like that. There's um, Liberate, which is uh, uh, an app that focuses on people of color specifically. Um, uh, so that's another app. And there's one more that I just learned about that is also uh, started by um, uh, some people of color, black woman, and I don't know what the other woman's ethnicity is. Um, But when it comes to me, I'll share it. Yes, yes, please do. Okay, so we're gonna start to wrap up. We might go a little, you know, 15 minutes over. Let us know in the comments if you're down with hanging out for another extra 15 minutes, because it's, you know, we wanna get to know Jen and Faith a little bit better. I have one question in the comments that I really want you guys to answer, and then we're going to go into the more personal question. So Aya is asking, what do you guys think of the DNA test? Um, so a lot of black folk are doing DNA tests to trace their roots to Africa. And, you know, there's all this stuff about what are they doing with our, with our you know, with our DNA, with our data, with our blood, like, <laughs> um, you know, medical waste. What is, what is the story there? So, um... I'm, just, I'm gonna take this from a policy front. Um, <laughs> and I'm just gonna say, and cause we've had actually, this is one thing in medicine that they are actually teaching us on. Um, I would be careful and make sure you read, and specifically very closely read, um, you know, the guidelines of where your genetic information is going to. Make sure that you understand it very clearly you know, what you're signing up for. Because you are, when you sign off for things, you're not too sure, you know, exactly what it's being used for. You may be agreeing to like, oh, I'm looking out for my, you know, ancestry stuff. But at the end of the day, your information might end up in a whole different study that you 
quote unquote consented to, but you really did not consent to. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just be careful, very much read that policy and what those companies are um, doing with other companies when it comes to genetic data. Um, and that's actually one of the things that we are taking policy wise um, when we're talking about racism as being a public health issue is that when we're looking towards the future is understanding how AI and all these genetic um, you know, components are playing a role in medicine for the future and making sure that you know, underrepresented minorities, black people, you know, Native Americans are not going to be again affected by you know our um, technological advances that are happening so make sure you're reading the policies for these things don't just sign up just because it's like oh yeah we're gonna look for you you know where you're from your exact tribe your blah blah, blah where you're from make sure you really understand where that information is going mm. that's deep any thoughts back to fear I'm a conspiracy theorist on this and I don't want I don't want my DNA going anywhere. Um, I understand why black people need it, um, especially African Americans in particular. I think for me, I'm pretty satisfied with knowing, you know, my ancestors, you know, are from Haiti. I'm very happy with that. I know the nine countries where Haitians came from. And um, my brother did the DNA test. And I mean, I feel like it's helpful, but I don't feel like it was like mind blowing for me because you know, and then you know, and I also Huh? Where did your brothers? What were your brothers' results? So uh, Nigeria came up Benin, but higher was Benin and Congo. I mean um, mm -hmm. Benin and um, uh, Benin and not Congo. It was another one right next door. I can't think of it at the moment. But it wasn't surprising because we know the French stole slaves from there. So I mean, <laughs> I was like, makes sense. And then a trickle here, some you know European DNA here. I mean. I mean, I knew that, right? I know based on what happened in Haiti, but um, I understand it more specifically for African Americans, I would say, because it's harder to trace back to some something. And I understand the emotional piece of wanting to do that. That makes a lot of sense. I'm privileged in being able to attach myself to Haiti and being very proud of that and being very proud of that history. But I understand people wanting to do that. But I'm very much like Faith said, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know what they're doing with this. And I had started the process of doing it a long time ago. And then, um, you know, people just started talking to me about stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to cancel this out. Mm -hmm. And plus, they weren't going to, at that time, this was so long ago, they weren't giving the information. Um, the, the federal government had put some block on something where you couldn't share um, certain types of information. So I found out they were only going to give me limited information. And I was like, well, then what's the point? Um, but I'm kind of happy I canceled it because like Faith said, now like everything's just kind of out there. It's and the wild west. It's the wild west. <laughs> it's it's wild. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want my, the, yeah, that, that's dangerous territory for me, so. Wow, Fairly says her, her dad was 30% Nigerian as well. All right, so as we wrap up, I wanna, I wanna ask you guys some questions about, you know, just to how you drive, right? How you come to be in a position to, to drive. So what is the secret to your success. Whoever wants to go first can take it. Well, we can go first. <laughs> as far as what? What are you what are you saying? Right. Like what's what what's your sauce? Like is it is it yoga meditation? Is it faith? Is it, you know Ah, okay, yeah. that's where you're going with this. It's, so it's so I guess we are talking about black genius, right? So we got to talk about, you know, people's individual genius and, and, and how you think that derives. So um, I would say that when it comes to like, I'll just stick with the question, what's your genius? Um, I feel like, and I, and I created that question, you didn't do that, but my, I feel like my genius is my ability to um, relate to different types of people. Um, uh, one thing I didn't mention is there was a period of my life where I did some modeling. And as a result of that, I learned how to deal with all types of different personalities. And so I feel like one of the genius uh, traits that I was given is the ability to relate to people. And also um, as a physician, people are always saying that they have no bedside manner, but my patients would say that I'm pretty good at being able to relate to them. And so secret sauce I think is being able to talk to different people and listening and um, allowing people to talk and express themselves, which I feel is not happening enough, especially as we talk about the health disparities and things like that. Um, and so that's a gift I've been given. As far as things that I do, 
Um, Lola, you're, you're on board with this. Um, I've been getting really, really um, firm with doing affirmations and writing things down. So uh, when you say secret sauce, if you, you know, they, even in the Bible, write the vision and make it plain, right? So if there are things that you're trying to manifest in your life, you have to write them down and you have to create a plan. Um, so I think it's really important to write things down, to visualize them, to listen to them. I'm really, this is like so strong for me right now. Um, and I think that everyone should be doing it because it's worked for me in times of my life. And then I realized I, I had to come back to that and start doing it again. And of course, Faith mentioned this uh, prayer. Prayer. Prayer is huge for me. Praying and meditation. That, that Those two things have got me through so many difficult situations in my life. Um, and, and so that, that's kind of what I would say is, is extremely important, being able to do that. Um, and then read knowledge. Knowledge is extremely important. <laughs> I am right. so blessed. You know, I'm, I'm so blessed that I came from a culture and also parents who were very firm with getting your education. I was reading at like two, three years old, you know, like that everything was always about like reading and learning and, and knowledge and you know, we, we need that knowledge in our community. We need knowledge of not only, they, they always talk about slavery, but they don't talk about when we were kings and queens. They don't talk about the Haitian Revolution. I'm going to say it again. They don't talk about the Haitian Revolution. It's important for us to know when we were victors in, in, um, in history. It's important to us to know when we were kings and queens in history. Because if you only believe that you're capable of just being a slave or always being the loser, that is the mentality that's passed down for our people. We're losers. We always are at the bottom. Why are we always at the bottom? Why does everyone hate us so much? We don't talk about when we were victors. We don't talk about when people came to our lands, our continent, and stole all the information. We don't talk about that. So it's important for us to know that we were victors and things change their cycles, right? And so things are going to cycle again. <laughs> but we need to have that knowledge of self to understand that we're just as capable, if not more, of being able to do some of these feats that people are talking about. Hence, Northwest, the importance of, of positive storytelling, aspirational storytelling. You don't have to go in Northwest anywhere. It's you have to. All right? You have to. Because that's part <laughs> of the narrative. What's your secret sauce? Um, I think um, for me, it was growing up in a family that, you know, yes, you know, understanding Black um, knowledge and Black, you know, um, people in a positive light was definitely heavy um, share. But also, like, as I mentioned in the previous conversation, that understanding how the world is. My mom never told me I'm an American. She's like, no, you're a global citizen. You know, I was always raised as saying, like, you know, you're not competing with these people who are in this room with you right now. You're competing with somebody in China. You're competing someone with somebody in Europe, you know, when it comes to academics. So understanding that you are not just a citizen here, but you're a citizen of the world and having that be brought into every aspect of my life. You know, growing up, when we're talking about Bobby Barbie dolls, you know, yes, I had black Barbie dolls, but I had Barbie dolls from all kinds of races. You know, my mom had the white girl. She had the Asian girl. She, had, she found the Native American one. She's like, you're going to learn how to respect everyone from every single part of the world because you are you know yes you're black and yes we've been through things but they've been through things too so understanding their stories really helped me understand how the world is shaped and that made me interested in understanding the history of the world because we all have different stories and we all fit into each other's stories differently um so understanding that aspect allows you to understand somebody else's who comes from a whole different culture and a whole different place and with having a mutual ground and a foundation allows you to then have a story of a conversation about race and then have a story about understanding the oppression of people when you're able to kind of like make that the foundation and get people to understand things so being having that foundation kind of really helped me form who i am and in terms of making sure that you know i remain centered and focused um i don't and I don't want to say this in a, like a very mean way. I'm just very protective of my circle and who's around me and who's my support system. You know, like I said, Jesus had 12 friends and really he really had 11 because we throw out Judas, right? So, you know, you know, if Jesus only had 11 friends, I don't need that many friends, you know, to make it through. So I'm very protective of who's in my circle and who I really call the word friend. Yes, I have, you know, acquaintances and things like that. And I'm a very friendly person. I never turn anyone away. But people who I go to and who I pour into are very limited. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that's just the, you know, as a person, when you're growing up in this world, you have to be careful who you pour into. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm very, um, you know, aware of that. And then as like Jen definitely pointed out prayer and having a people, not only you praying, but having a, a community of people who pray for you mm-hmm. and you pray for them. Wow. Because, you know, as the Bible said, you know, you know, if, you know, one can put 10,000 a fight, you know, two can put, you know, even more than that. So mm-hmm. having that prayer circle and having that prayer community and, you know, in medicine, you need prayer. I have not <laughs> met a black physician who does not believe in prayer, who does sure. not believe in some form of religion. Yes. To make it through. And you need that, and especially in medicine, because there's only if we're just looking at black women in medicine. Oh, there's only two percent of us in this country who are black and female. Next time, next time we talk, because we're gonna have to do this again, we're gonna talk about why why doctors are so miserable. <laughs> that's a whole um, that's a whole other that's a whole other episode. So my last question for both of you is what does black liberation mean for you? Mm. And I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it a joint question because you're not gonna throw in my $10 million question. So what does black liberation mean to you and what would you do with $10 million to further the cause of black liberation. Oh wow. Okay. That's that's well, that's hard. You didn't tell me the $10 million part. But um <laughs> the uh, black liberation for me is um it involves black uh economics and uh black empowerment overall. Uh when people hear that term they seem to think that means that there's a lack of empowerment for other people. Like I love how people take like the the focus on blackness and always turn it into anti-whiteness and it that's mm. not what it is. And so I repeat that's not what it is. Black people need empowerment because they're constantly taught and told that they are nothing and mm. that they need empowerment just to get to the baseline of everybody else. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, Black Lives Matter does not mean all other lives don't matter. Like, how do people even yes. create this? That's why I say people create what they want to create, right? But I'll, I'll get back. I'll get back. So Black empowerment to me involves, um, you know, economics. And we need to get back to economics. We need to support Black businesses. We need to keep encouraging each other um, with, you know, the amazing innovations that we make in tech and medicine, um, you know, in all different types of platforms. We just need to uh, really uh, understand our accomplishments in those areas. Um, it's not enough to just have one area um, being tended to. And then the other piece is, of course, we're talking about health. Um, and you talked about people being empowered in that um, area. We need to learn more about our health. We need to take more responsibility for our health. So we are, we cannot be liberated if we don't have a sense of control and understanding about health and economics, which are two of the places that we're failing miserably. And you can't, I mean, you can't be a happy human. You can't um, be a, a person who's um, flourishing in life without those two areas. Having wealth and being rich also involves being healthy. And you can't truly be healthy if you don't have the economic portion uh, and vice versa. You just you just you just can't have it. So that's what liberation means to me, having both of those things. So what would you do with the 10 million? That's hard. Can you ask Faith and then I'll come back to the 10 million? <laughs> Black Scream out loud. All right, Faith. What's your um, for me, Black Liberation is really um incorporating it in all aspects and all races because yes you know we talk about you know underrepresented but even within underrepresented people there is a form of anti-blackness that is there that we do not talk about and um we have to make sure that they understand that they are distributing you know aspects of anti-blackness that is there that makes them you know choose to choose to treat people differently within their own race and with their own culture and they have not read yet you know come to that realization as well um, so I'm glad for the movement and seeing that, you know, I follow like an Asian American um, person on, on IG and they're like, no, you have anti-blackness. Asian Americans need to address their own anti-blackness because if it wasn't for the policies of black people in the 1960s, we would not have been able to immigrate here. They did that for us and they, will, they didn't even think of us and they did that for us. So, you know, bringing that awareness to other cultures, the idea of like combating anti-blackness within that. So that's part of, you know, black liberation as well that we don't really talk about. Um, and it's what um, Jen said also, you know, financial literacy, you know, understanding, getting black people to understand group economics and saying like, yes, it's important to invest in property. It is important to understand what, you know, 40 acres and a mule was, you know, and what that uh, policy would have meant towards us. 
And then for me uh, specifically, it's important to understand that, you know, what I would do with the $10 million is really to use it as a way to really incorporate history, not only in the education system, but history in all aspects of our lives. Understand the history of the church and the rise of the black church. Understand the history wow. you know, of grocery stores. Understand the history wow. of you know, sports, you know, we, it needs to be incorporated in all aspects of our lives because we have been so disenfranchised in understanding the true history of our country. And that's the reason why we have people like Drew Brees coming out and saying statements when, you know, he, you know, if it wasn't for black men who were his linemen, he would never have won that Super Bowl, you know, but someone has to sit down with him and talk about, okay, bro, like, I need you to take a step back and really look at this before him. He was like, oh, snap, I didn't realize what I was saying when I said it. So we need education in terms of history through all aspects of our lives. And just bringing back to the importance of that in policy, um, when we're talking about history, as of right now, um, the Senate had the bill for the anti-lynching bill that has been a bill um, that's been up for 120 years. 120 years it has taken this country for us to talk about lynching and make lynching a federal crime. As of yesterday, it was um, Senator Rand Paul, who most people don't realize is also a physician, um, who was the main person who opposed the Senate from passing this anti-lynching bill. Mind you, it took you 120 years for this to pass. So when I'm talking about the importance of history, mind you, like I said, physicians are not taught the history. We are not taught history of medicine. There are physicians who are out there who graduate from medical school who know nothing of the history of the people that they are treating. Um, and it's important for us to incorporate in all aspects of lives because I'm not going to say that, you know, Rand Paul is a questionable man anyways. I'm not going to say a history lesson would have changed it. But people who are <laughs> on that path to become a Rand Paul, would that, will that change them? That's mm -hmm. the question that we have to ask, you know? Wow. Okay. This has been amazing. <laughs> okay. Wait, wait, hold on. I want to do the $10 million question. Okay. You know what, it's going to incorporate, I'm not going to be super specific, but um, it kind of just goes along to what I was saying. And I, I love that Faith spent so much time on history because I was having that conversation yesterday with my husband. Growing up, I didn't like history because it only painted one picture of history, right? And they say history is told from the perspective of the victor. And so in America, we only hear one side. And so it kind of goes back to what I was talking about. Um, you know, about Black people not seeing themselves as victors or anything that they've contributed anything valuable in history, which is a lie. So it would incorporate um, education, like, like Faith said, but also for me, um, you know, we talk about these clinics and we talk about healthcare. So a big piece of that for me is putting that money into healthcare so that, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I still don't feel like it's black people's job to educate people on certain things. That's still, I, it's still a sticking point for me. But maybe if we can invest some of that money in cultural, um, you know, cultural sensitivity and that kind of uh, information, if we could focus on getting more quality facilities in people's um, urban neighborhoods, maybe that would be helpful. Um, maybe if we put money into some of these programs, you know, um, the focus of uh, my husband had started a nonprofit and the focus of it is to put in financial literacy, to put in health knowledge and equity to put in all these pieces. So it would have to go to something like that, you know? So I just wanted to answer that piece. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, well, we're gonna wrap up. This has been amazing. Thank you everybody who's been watching. Shout out to my team. Um, Raquel Faith is also on the team. <laughs> so we know our last week, we're rolling deep. <laughs> Our team has doubled in the last couple of weeks. I better recognize, yo, go to norlives.org and make a donation because we're totally about to, you know, overthrow white supremacy. We're having a lot of fun doing it. So support our work. If you enjoyed this podcast, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you tag like black people to hear this conversation. We're saying that when you know black folks are not aware of this and that, but we have to be the ones to give them that knowledge, right? So. Let's make sure that we do our parts to spread the good news, spread the good word. Um, stick around, stick, you know, stick close with Noir Press because we're going to be doing our parts to spread the good word. Um, shout out to the rest of our team, Devin, um, Sabrina. Shout out to my new co-founder, Uzo. Shout out to uh, Jack and God. I'm, I'm cursing. <laughs> I'm about to get to the point where I can't remember all of all of our team members. Um, Thank you, Noir fan, for watching. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Share this post. Follow us on Instagram, Noir Press. 
Twitter, Northwest, Facebook, follow this page, and like I said, share this video. We love y'all. Eat your greens, take your vitamin C, drink your water, meditate. <laughs> Stay up, love on each other because the only way we're going to get liberated is to stick together and look out for each other. Nobody else is going to do it for us but us, okay? Take it easy. We love y'all. Peace.